Hello, this presentation, Introduction to Subsurface Drainage, is the first in a series of presentations related to subsurface drainage design. Our goal with this series is to provide you with the knowledge you need to design subsurface drainage systems and underground outlets. Subsurface drainage is a very important practice in the Corn Belt and Iowa. Without improved drainage, the Iowa landscape would look very different today. I'm Bruce Atherton, Agricultural Engineer with NRCS in Ankeny, Iowa. Let's learn a little of the history, importance, and effects of subsurface drainage. In this presentation, we will set the stage for subsurface drainage design. Our goals are to define subsurface drainage, also known as tile drainage, review the development of subsurface drainage, we're going to list several agronomic benefits of subsurface drainage. And then we're going to review the environmental effects of subsurface drainage. <clears throat> the definition of subsurface drainage can be found in NRCS Conservation Practice Standard 606 subsurface drain, where subsurface drain is defined as a conduit installed between beneath the ground surface to collect and or convey excess water. This excess water is water that fills the pore spaces of saturated soil and is also called gravitational water. The purpose of a subsurface drain is to remove or distribute excessive soil water or to remove salts and other contaminants from the soil profile. The underground outlet is a related practice. An underground outlet contains many of the same components that a subsurface drainage system does although its purpose is somewhat different. An underground outlet is defined as a conduit or system of conduits installed beneath the surface of the ground to convey surface water to a suitable outlet. The purpose is to carry water to a suitable outlet from terraces, water and sediment control basins, diversions, waterways, surface drains, and other similar practices or flow concentrations without causing damage by erosion or flooding. Let's take a look at the history of subsurface drainage. An extrusion machine was invented in England in 1838 to make clay tile. This machine was imported into the United States by 1848. And in 1862, David Ogden developed a machine to make concrete tile. By 1880, there were over a thousand tile factories in the United States, mainly in Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. Subsurface drains were initially installed by hand, and this continued into the 20th century. The larger drains were installed with the assistance of draft animals. By the end of the 19th century, mechanization led to the development of a mechanical ditching machine. James B. Hill invented the Buckeye Ditcher, and he was from Ohio. He received patent number 523,790 for the ditcher on July 31st, 1894. Now, uh, James Hill was a prolific inventor, and in 1907, he received pat a patent for the traction apron that is known today as the Caterpillar Tread. This machine, uh, number 88, was restored by the Hancock County, Ohio Museum Association and is an example of the first successful machine ditcher. It has been designated a historic landmark by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. Approximately 700 Buckeye steam traction ditchers were built and shipped from Findlay, Ohio before 1910, and ultimately more than 2,000 were sold in northwestern Ohio and southern Ontario. By the early 20th century, the steam engines were replaced by internal combustion engines. Scientific American carried an article showing this ditcher in 1904. Looks like a pretty large one. The Buckeye ditcher was also used in Canada and Africa. The same basic machine is still in use today, albeit with many improvements. Now, modern wheel trenchers 
are diesel powered, utilize laser control, and some probably even incorporate GPS control. In the late 1940s, the development of plastic pipe as a drain material began. Glenn Schwab installed plastic drains at Iowa State University between 1947 and 1956. Corrugated plastic pipe or tubing was developed in Europe and the first research using this material, corrugated plastic pipe, was done in Ohio in 1965 by Glenn Schwab. I guess he moved from Iowa to Ohio. The first U.S. manufacturer of corrugated plastic pipe was Advanced Drainage Systems, now known as ADS, based in Columbus, Ohio, in 1967. Hancore Incorporated in 1969 is another major manufacturer of corrugated plastic pipe. Hancore was a division of Hancock Brick and Tile, which obviously made drainage tile prior to going into the corrugated plastic pipe business. Development of the laser level occurred in the 1960s as well. Robert Studebaker filed a patent application for the laser level in 1966 and formed the Laser Plane Corporation, which is now Spectra Precision. The laser plane was first used on a Spiker trencher in 1968 and in 1975, the world's first electronic self-leveling rotating laser was built. The 1960s also saw the development of plows for drain installation. The concept actually dates to the 1850s. Of course, they didn't have the material or the mechanization to be able to utilize it at that time. Again, in the 1960s and also at Ohio, uh, James Faust uh, did research on using plows for drain installation. Plows became practical after the introduction of corrugated plastic tubing and laser grade control. This is the machine used by Jim Faust for his research at Ohio State University. Uh, modern drainage plows are obviously diesel powered and many of them use late uh, GPS control. Recently, smaller drainage plows have been developed for use with large agricultural tractors. And this slide shows several uh, different uh, smaller drainage plows. However, not all of these machines are capable of installing drain pipe to NRCS specifications. I know at least one of these uh, machines does not have a means of cutting a groove in the bottom of the trench to pop properly support the pipe. As noted earlier, subsurface drainage is very important in Iowa. Some decade-old estimates for Iowa include uh, 36 million acres of land in Iowa, of which 23 million acres is in row crops, and that's probably higher today. 9 million acres with artificial subsurface drainage. And if that averaged 100 foot spacing, that would uh, result in over 700,000 miles of drain tile and pipe in the ground in Iowa. There are 6 million acres in over 3,000 organized drainage districts. And as most of you know, recently high crop prices and profits have led farmers to install drain pipes so extensively that the manufacturers could not keep up with demand. Since there was so much drainage in place, a lot of people required outlets for their drain tiles. So the drainage district laws have organized and required participation by reluctant landowners. The majority of drainage districts in Iowa formed between 1904 and 1919, and this was just after the law was implemented uh, in the early 1900s. An interesting item is that in Greene County, they organized 155 districts during this time period, an average of one every five weeks. 
Now the result of this uh, activity a hundred years ago means that these tile mains are about a hundred years old in many cases. And many, if not most of these systems, are under design for today's drainage needs and cropping patterns. So let's look at the benefits of cropland drainage. Why do farmers install so much drain tile? Miles and miles and miles of it. Here are some of the benefits of improved drainage from an agronomic viewpoint. Well, it removes excess water, which improves the crop rooting environment, enhances the soil warming process in the spring, provides improved trafficability, which results in more timely field operations and earlier planting dates, reduces soil compaction since the soil is, is not as wet, it increases nitrogen availability and efficiency, uh, you can have denitrification in wet soils. The bottom line is that it increases yields and income, which is a pretty strong incentive to install subsurface drainage in spite of the cost. Although this is an old slide, it illustrates uh, two aspects of the agronomic benefits of improved drainage. The bars represent how more intense drainage, going from undrained to surface-only drainage to subsurface-only drainage, and combined surface and subsurface drainage results in higher average yields. And th these are old figures, but the, from the undrained, they had about 60 bushels per acre of corn and uh, went up to 120 bushels per acre of corn. The shading in the background, the shaded graph, represents the other facet of improved range. And this is that there's a reduced year-to-year -year variability in yields. In other words, not only are the average yields increased, the yield variability from year to year is decreased. It's pretty obvious that installing subsurface drainage has a considerable effect on the hydrology in a field. So we're going to look at some of those uh, effects which I've labeled environmental effects of subsurface drainage. So if we compare undrained agricultural land on field level with no surface intakes, uh, to improve subsurface drainage, we find that uh, it'll remove wetland characteristics. We reduce the peak runoff rate 15 to 30 percent. It'll reduce the total surface runoff that leaves a site 29 to 65 percent. And we kind of we already know that from how our uh, curve number method of determining runoff is. Our hydrologic soil group groups reflect this. If you have a soil with a, a two say a C slash D hydrologic soil group, the C reflects the drain condition, which is less runoff, and D reflects the undrained condition, which is more runoff. Also, since we're reducing the runoff, we're going to reduce sediment erosion and sediment losses by 16 to 65%. Since we reduce sediment, much, much of the phosphorus is, is attached to the sediment, reduce that up to 45%. And the same with other soil bound nutrients, we reduce those 30 to 55, 50%. So drainage is not a bad thing uh, for the environment necessarily. However, there's one, one is one bad thing, and that's it increases nitrate nitrogen losses. So to summarize, I guess, in the hydrologic content, the presence of subsurface drainage will generally increase infiltration, which is going to decrease runoff and sediment loss. And because of this, it tends to increase the losses of more mobile compounds like nitrates that will flow with the drainage water. That will decrease runoff losses of sorbed compounds such as pesticides and phosphorus. In the next few slides, we're going to consider the effects of increased nitrate transport via subsurface drainage. This slide illustrates the changes that occurred in nitrate concentrations in Midwest rivers over the last century. So I have a question I would have for you is what's changed? Why have why these nitrate concentrations gone? Gone from relatively low levels, the yellow bars, to relatively high levels, which are the blue bars. 
So in the 20th century, we, we saw major changes in land use cropping. We saw a major increase in fertilizer use. And as we just discussed, a major increase in subsurface drainage. Looking at crop changes in Iowa, this illustrates uh, the change in cropping patterns between 1920 and 2010. You can see a big change there was in the soybean acres. In 1920, there was uh, almost no soybean production in Iowa, but by 2010, we had almost 10 million acres of soybeans grown in Iowa. Going along with that, we had a high de a decrease in the small grain and hay acreage in Iowa. If we just look at the Raccoon River watershed, which I found some numbers on, we can see that uh, we can see those same land use changes. The corn and soybean acres went from just over 50 percent to nearly 100 percent in the Raccoon River watershed between 1949 and 2005 whereas the small grain and alfalfa acres decreased from nearly 50% to uh, less than 5% in that time period. So a lot of these changes took place after World War II. If we look at some values out of the river over time here, uh, this graph shows the concentration in the Iowa River at Gifford between the year 2000 and 2011. What we see is an annual variation in the nitrate levels. Almost every year has a peak above the drinking water standard of 10 milligrams per liter. And yet, uh, later in the year, we have a depression at sometimes near zero milligrams per liter. So it's quite variable. But of course, if there's a water supply system that takes their water supply from the river, they're going to have problems anytime those concentrations get over 10 milligrams per liter. Many of you probably remember, especially if you live in or near Des Moines, that 2013 saw record nitrate levels in some Iowa rivers. Des Moines takes its drinking water from the Raccoon and Des Moines rivers, and you can see that 2013 uh, saw much higher nitrate levels than the pre even the previous record, over nearly twice or over twice the drinking water standard. These record high nitrate levels meant that the Des Moines Water Treatment Facility had to remove nitrates at a cost of over $7,000 per day. And the nearly 500,000 people that utilize that supply are going to pay for that. This slide uh, from courtesy of Matt Helmers illustrates the inherent variability of nitrate levels in Iowa's rivers. We can see that the nitrate loader loss closely follows the amount of drainage uh, that exits the subsurface drainage system, the green and red lines. You can see they track very closely. However, the concentration does vary quite a bit. Under high flows, for example, in 1993, the concentration was generally low, while the concentration increases when the flows are lower. The last three years, we've been monitoring uh, nitrate concentrations in some subsurface drains and also in some bioreactors, denitrifying bioreactors. And this is some of the data uh, collected by the Iowa Soybean Association and paid for through the Equip Practice 799 monitoring and evaluation. I show you this slide to illustrate that the nitrate levels can vary tremendously from site to site. The first column there, LCN, you can see ranges up to 45 milligrams per liter on the 16th of May. But if we look at LEC2N, the last column there, we see that uh, 6.7 is the maximum level. So I think we need to be aware of these variations as we target our efforts to reduce nitrate levels in Iowa. 
We do have several practices that farmers can use to reduce the export of nitrates uh, from their drainage systems. But the efficiency and effectiveness varies from site to site. Uh, some of these are fairly new practices and, and we don't understand them completely yet. You will notice that many of these practices reduce nitrate concentrations in the range of 30 to 60 percent. For instance, if we look at, if we change, change from row crops to alfalfa grass, we can reduce nitrate levels 90 percent roughly. Rye cover crops appear to reduce at about 50 percent, 50 to 60 percent. If we change the drain intensity, we can reduce nitrates by 15 to 40 percent. Drainage water management can reduce at 30 to 50 percent. Bioreactors seem to be able to reduce nitrate levels 15 to 40 percent. Saturated buffers, a very new practice, is in the 30 to 60 percent reduction range. And constructed wetlands are 40 to 90 percent. I want you to keep in mind, you know, a lot, again, a lot of these are in the 30 to 60 percent range. Probably all of you are aware of the Iowa Nutrient Reduction Strategy. And found in that strategy, it says accounting for potential load reduction from point sources, that's our cities and uh, factories and things, non-point sources need to achieve a 41% load reduction in nitrogen and 29% load reduction in phosphorus to meet the overall 45% reduction goal. So the question is, how many acres will have to be treated to achieve a 41% reduction in nitrate load? And I think the short answer is nearly everything. If most of our practices are going to be in the 30 to 60% range. To get 41% overall, we're going to have to treat everything. So I've heard a couple of different people quoted as saying that nitrate, nutrient reduction is voluntary for Iowa's farmers. But it's not optional. One thing you as, as uh, technicians and conservationists with NRCS and with the state in Iowa, I urge you to discuss nitrate reduction with your clients. Make sure they understand uh, what this is, right? Like right now, as I said, nitrate reduction is voluntary, but it may not always be that way if we can't get the levels down. You may have seen uh, these nitrate test strips. They're inexpensive and an easy way to get a general idea of what the nitrate levels are in tile water. This is an example we used here in northern Polk County in 2013 and had uh, levels over 20 mill milligrams per liter. And discuss alternative practice with your clients. So in summary, in this pre presentation, we've learned a little bit more about subsurface drainage. We've learned there are large financial and agronomic benefits from subsurface drainage. There are many positive environmental effects from subsurface drainage, but we know that nitrates in surface waters is a major effect of subsurface drainage, and that's going to require everybody's uh, cooperation to resolve that issue. That brings us to the end of this presentation. I hope you found this uh, presentation helpful. I urge you to call me or email me if you have questions or comments about the subject. I'm always looking for ways to improve these presentations. Good luck.